one of the first things uh, I wanted to kind of talk about was what I'm looking for in a cultivar and then kind of where they might come from. Um, so we're here in Chicago. It's really cold. Um, so we're looking for plants that can handle that. So we're going for um, zone 5, zone 4B hardiness around uh, negative 20 Fahrenheit um, or about negative 30 Celsius. Um, we're looking for plants that are really urban tolerant. So plants that can handle the compact soils, pollution, um, periodic inundation potentially, um, alkalinity. Uh, we're looking for plants that have uh, increases in pest resistance. So if we have a species of something that we think would be really great, but it gets uh, some type of gall on it, if we can find something that doesn't get that gall, it'd be a great potential introduction. Um, we're looking for plants that have ornamental merit, um, whatever that may be, uh, any of those fun freaks. And then we're looking for plants that have good behavior. And I kind of say good behavior, and I mean a lot of things. Um, if we're not talking about oaks, and I guess in some cases with oaks, we're talking about non-invasiveness. Uh, we don't want plants that are going to be jumping the fence and going into the wild. We're looking for plants that don't drop limbs and branches, messy fruits, all of those things. Um, so. What is a cultivar? Um, well, we just had a really wonderful presentation on some new cultivars, uh, but a cultivar is best if you kind of think about apples. They can come from um, a lot of different places, but it starts with one tree. Um, and if you go to the grocery store and apples, you have Gala, you have Honeycrisp, you have Golden Delicious, all of those flavors. Um, those are actually all sold by a cultivar name. So it originated from one tree. Um, a farmer may have grown it from seed and they said, oh wow, this apple is special. Um, they started taking cuttings or grafts off of that one plant and that, whole, that one plant became a row, became an orchard, um, and then eventually would become orchards all over the world. So there's literally hundreds, thousands, millions of clones, essentially, is what a cultivar is um, all over the world. So with oaks, there are a lot of ornamental cultivars already out there. Um, so this is Concordia. It's a Quercus rober with these uh, kind of buttery yellow leaves. Um, there is a cultivar Propria that has purple leaves in Quercus rober. Um, some of the newer ones that have come out are some of these hybrids that are really great. Um, this is a wary eye hybrid, which is bicolor by um, Robur fastigiata group. Um, Nadler, Kindred Spirit, and Earl Colley and Josh Nadler Cooperative introduction. Um, and then another fantastic tree um, for Guy is uh, Chimney Fire. Um, which is taking one of these wary eye hybrids to the next step and having it cross with an alba um, to bring out some fall color. So they are produced asexually, so they are clones. Um, if you grow a seed and you get some similar characteristics, that is still not the cultivar, so don't do that. Um, that's why there's a fastigiata mess. Um, and cultivars are so important for our landscapes <laughs> because they really give us these predictable and uniform plants. Um, and there's something that makes it special and makes it unique. So these are uh, long, another Coley selection, uh, Regal Prints. Um, so they're upright, they're narrow. You can use them in places you might not be able to use a regular oak. So cultivars are important. There's a lot of conservation people in here, but I hope we can serve cultivars too. And just to re-emphasize again, cultivars are clonally propagated. And with oaks, we're doing this grafting. Um, we're doing it in hot callus tubes. Um, so this is actually our hot callus system here at the Arboretum. It's pr a little bit primitive, where we just have these uh, foam um, tubes. Uh, we run some hot water uh, through these little spaghetti tubes that we actually use for bottom heat during propagation. We just put them inside the tubes, um, plug the end of it, and then uh, inside this peat um, and perlite mixture are the roots. You can see the top of the you can see the top of the uh, scion um, here, and then in the middle is um, it's being kept warm, and that's where the graft union is. So we know what a cultivar is, but what is plant breeding? Plant breeding is finding that cultivar. Um, and you gotta have a sharp eye, because you gotta look at a lot of plants to find the one that really, truly is the best, or truly is unique. So, we can find these a few different ways. Um, one of those is to go out and look for what we call a chance seedling. So if you grow enough seed, you can probably find something that's different. <laughs> if you look at enough plants that have been grown by, from seed by somebody else, you can still find something pretty unique. Um, so this is a Kentucky coffee tree that's been growing here at the Arboretum since uh, 1958. Um, pretty cool, pretty unique, not an oak. So I don't hear a lot of gasp. I heard a couple. Um, but uh, so this is a potential for um, an introduction. It's really, it's different. And that's what's important. Um, 
with oaks, uh, this is an example. I've grown enough seed of, uh, these are Quercus michauii, and I found one that has these purple leaves that I'm really excited about. Um, so it's, you just got to look at enough plants, and you'll find something special, um, whether it's in the wild or in a living collection or wherever. Um, and you can also find natural mutations that happen in our landscapes. So some people, like conifer people, they say go to cemeteries and look up for witches' brooms, things like that. Um, but if you look down at the ground, this is Helianthemum pneumolarium. It's called a rock rose. It's kind of a low subshrub woody ground cover. Um, I found this tiny little variegated sport about my second week here at the Arboretum, and I was really excited about it. So I propagated it, and we got a whole plant that has that variegated pattern. Um, you propagate off that again and again and again. It's consistent, potentially an introduction, but it's an obscure collector's plant which isn't our goals. We want tough urban trees. Um, so the, the way people mostly think about plant breeding is the more conventional approach, where we're actually doing controlled hybridization. So we choose one parent we like, we choose another parent we like, and we're the people moving the pollen. Um, so the first step in this would really be to, um, number one, I guess, choose your parents. Number two, go out and protect your flowers. So with oaks um, or hazelnuts, in this case, what I did is I go out early and I put on these paper bags on emasculated branches. So I rip off all the, the male catkins. Um, I wait for the flowers to begin to open, and I do it a little bit of a messy way. I rip that bag off, and then I just swamp it with tons of pollen from who I want to be the dad. Um, and then I put the bag back on, staple it closed, wait a couple of weeks until all the, the hazelnuts or all the oaks are finished uh, blooming, and then um, uh, continue to wait for that fruit to develop. Um, put a, I'll put a cage on it, like a wire cage to protect it from vermin um, towards the end of summer. Then I'll go back, I'll collect those fruit, um, sow them out, and then you start the evaluation process. So... Um, we kind of hit on this a little bit yesterday, and then today, I mean, there's a lot of cultivars we did talk about, um, but there aren't that many oak cultivars compared to cultivars of other genera. If you look at Acer, or if you look at some of those other groups, there are so many more cultivars available. And I think this is for a few different reasons. Number one, oak seedlings, I mean, generally, if you grow enough of them, they're pretty nice. Um, so that might be a reason that's potentially limiting how many cultivars of oaks have made it into the trade. Um, also, propagating oaks isn't the necessarily the easiest thing. You can't just do cuttings. They don't do well in tissue culture. Um, there's all these things against them. And then even with grafting, um, although it is successful with the white oak group, it requires extra planning. You need to have that rootstock on hand. It takes extra time. Um, it takes skill. Not everybody has those skills, especially kind of at this era, uh, I feel like um, grafters and specialty propagators are kind of d uh, dwindling. Um, and then overall, people are also concerned about graft compatibility long term or worried about suckers and rootstocks and all those different issues. Um, but then on a breeding perspective, oaks are highly heterozygous. They have a lot of um, different alleles at their loci, um, which it masks any recessive traits, really, that are hiding within these genomes. And then also, they're long-lived in outcrossing, which supports them being heterozygous, and then also makes any type of like an inbreeding program to try to pull out any recessive traits impossible. Um, so there are a few different things. But I think that there potentially is a solution. And this is my favorite solution. I always love talking about ploidium manipul manipulation. So um, what is ploidy? Ploidy is the number of sets of chromosomes that an organism has. So with humans, we are diploid. So we have 46 chromosomes. You get one half from mom and one half from dad. There are 23 pairs. Um, but plants are incredibly plastic and variable in their level of ploidy. Um, so for Gary or strawberry, it goes anywhere from being a diploid, like us, to a de uh, dodecaploid, so having 12 sets of chromosomes. And the base chromosome number is 7 instead of 23. So 2 times 7, 14 chromosomes. That's not very many. But 12 times 7, I'm not going to do math on the spot. <laughs> Um, but so um, another example about po uh, polyploidy that exists in nature, um, Cotoneaster, it's one of my favorite plants. Um, it has a base chrom number, chromosome number of 17. Um, there's a species Cotoneaster henryanus that exists in the wild as a diploid. There's Cotoneaster vandalarii that exists in nature as a tetraploid. Um, so you can actually count the chromosomes here and you'll see that there are 34 or 68. Um, oaks, however, are only diploid as far as I know. Um, so that means they have two sets of chromosomes. Their base um, number is 12, so they have only have 24 chromosomes. That's a pretty easy number to deal with. Um, 
Except when an oak is going through or when anything is going through its natural life cycles, there are variations in ploidy that are happening. So the oak itself is a diploid, it's a parent cell, and as it moves into um, meiosis, it's gonna double those chromosomes. So for that instant, it's actually a tetraploid, or that cell is a tetraploid. And then as it continues to divide, it ends up making haploid pollen. So that has um, half the genetic material of the plant. So now we're kind of thinking about ploidy and differences in ploidy through the life cycle of oaks. Um, where can we take this? Well, if pollen has half the genetic material of um, a, a traditional uh, whole plant, um, the sporophyte um, or the oak tree, then maybe that would be a way we could um, kind of manipulate the ploidy on these guys. So we're not thinking about breeding with oak acorns. Um, so we're going to be looking at these haploid um, pollen gr uh, grains or um, microspores. So we're going to be taking the anthers off of the oak tree or taking the catkins off the oak tree, putting them onto a tissue culture media, and then growing that to get plants out of it at the end. Well, that's what we're hoping. <laughs> Um, to take a, a zoom in on a chromosome and kind of see what's going on. Um, so we have our diploid oak over here again. So you can see that this chromosome, it has this stuff going on. This chromosome, there's this stuff going on. They don't match up. They aren't mere images of each other because it's heterozygous. So we're going to take a haploid microspore and eventually we want to uh, induce polyploidy again to get this um, homozygous individual at the end, pulling out all those recessive traits and making an inbred line. Um, so I found this really nice protocol um, by Pintos and um, a couple other people in Spain where they were looking at producing double haploid oaks in Quercus suber, the cork oak, um, and then actually going through and verifying that they truly have these double haploids. And because they were doing this with Quercus suber, I was like, okay, well, what are some of these cerus type oaks that grow well in our environment? Quercus cerus, how handy. So we have that in our living collections. So I... Um, went out and I collected these uh, male catkins just as they were starting to elongate or about May 1st um, last year in 2014. And then we surface sterilized them in bleach and then alcohol and then a couple <laughs> rinses of water. Um, and then we put them onto a tissue culture induction media. Um, so this is kind of what it looked like in the beginning. So we have them on the media. They're just whole catkins. I actually had taken some where I had plucked off individual anthers as well. Um, to see which one may be better at inducing this callus. Um, and it's going through a starvation cycle and kind of a, a heat shock as well. So it's a really low sugar media. Um, there aren't any growth regulators on it. We're just trying to get these microspores that are starting to, they're starting on their development pathway to start to freak out a little bit. We want them to turn into callus, become disorganized. So um, after a little while, we did end up getting callus that was starting to emerge from our whole catkins. Um, I wish I had a better photo of like it was like when it was on the whole catkin, but this is kind of after I've kind of gone through and busted them up a little bit um, and swapped over to the embryo induction media. So then we got our embryos that we put them on another media to proliferate them. This is kind of a zoom closed in on the, the oak embryos we're starting to get. Um, then. We move on to a maturation media. We take these embryos, we put them through a vernalization cycle. So we have to grow them on this media for a little while. We put them in the fridge for a couple months. We pull these embryos back out of the fridge and then we try to get them to germinate. So um, not the best photo again, but we have um, these little embryos that are starting to actually produce shoots. They're green um, and they're germinating. So this is really exciting. I kind of didn't think it was gonna happen on my first go. Um, so I didn't do statistical numbers on these things. This was just me kind of doing this as a back burner pet project to see if I could do it. Um, so next round, I wanna go in with a more um, different taxa and see if we can do this maybe with some of the white oaks and things like that as well. Um, so we're working on getting to this point with plant establishment. Um, again, I mentioned it's kind of a back burner project and it takes time. I mean, we're putting these things into vernalization for a couple months, we're pulling them in, putting them out, and then I've got this other stuff going on here at the Arboretum. So um, we're gonna get there, hopefully. Um, but the next step really is gonna be to take these embryos and take these plantlets in tissue culture and verify that they truly are derived from the microspores and not from the maternal cell walls of the anther. Um, so, 
we can do this a couple of different ways. So the first thing we can do is we can look at the ploidy level of these embryos. And we have this really handy dandy flow cytometer here at the Arboretum. Um, so actually I did a couple of these this morning. Um, again, I didn't have huge numbers. I did three embryos to see where we were at. And um, the way that it works is we are taking tissue, we're chopping through it with a razor blade in a nuclei extraction buffer. So we're getting these nucleus to float out into the solution. We stain them. And the more DNA they have, essentially, the more dye they're picking up. And then as it travels through the machine, there's a light source in there that excites that dye. And it begins to glow. And it's measuring how much it's glowing. So the more DNA it has, the more dye it picks up, the brighter it glows. Um, and you can use this calculation if you have an internal standard in there, which I do. I use this P plant, which has 8.76 picograms of DNA. And um, by using that calculation, we have our oak. Uh, this is the uh, um, maternal, um, I don't want to use the word maternal, really. It's the original plant, so the, the donor for this study. Um, and so we're seeing that this one here has um, 8.3 sorry, 1.83 picograms of DNA, which is um, consistent with other diploids that have been studied before by Zol um, Zoldos et al. in 1998. They report a corcoceris being 1.9 picograms of DNA. There's a little bit of variation there, but that's not enough to say that there's a difference in ploidy level by any means. You'd really expect it to be double or something like that. But again, this is the maternal tissue. So, um, whoops. So I ran three embryos, and we ended up getting all those three diploids. So I'm hoping we'll still find some haploid embryos. But it's not surprising that we had spontaneous induct, um, polyploid uh, doubling, potentially, in tissue culture, because the haploid state is very unstable. Um, plants aren't meant to be haploid. Nobody's meant to be haploid, um, other than gametes. So I'm thinking that hopefully we had some spontaneous doubling, and hopefully we'll find haploid embryos. Uh, but at this point, it looks like we have spontaneous doubling, or we have maternal wall tissue. Issue. So um, the next step, using these same embryos, um, is going to be, can you guys tell what this is? But it's a tiny satellite, so it's going to be microsatellite markers um, to be able to tell potentially if um, we have these, uh, these doubled haploids. Um, and then long term, um, once we're able to pull these plants out of tissue culture, we might be able to make direct selections for cultivars out of these. So if we have these recessive traits, there might be really novel looking plants. Um, the other thing we could do is treat these plants like inbred lines. If we have a line of Quercus that is um, homozygous at all loci, and then we take a, a line of Quercus acutissima, for example, that's homozygous at all loci, and we cross two of those individuals, every single acorn from that cross is going to be genetically uniform. So we might be able to create like a seed strain clonal oak, like an F1 hybrid corn. Um, and that's kind of, it's starting to get a little bit crazy. I don't know if I'm going to be able to do that type of thing in my lifetime, but I think it's a really cool idea that we can investigate at least. Um, so, uh, treating oaks like corn. Um, and again, we're going to create multiple lines, uh, do control crossings, determine the good pairs, and then we can isolate those um, other places in the world or in giant pollination cages. Um, if we find these haploids, we can also artificially induce polyploidy um, using a chemical called arizolin. And I do this with some of my other work. So I just kind of want to mention some of that too. Um, so we mentioned that uh, as a cell is going through its normal cell cycle, it has instances where it's moving from a diploid to a tetraploid state, or it's doubling. And if we apply the chemical arizolin um, during these cell division events, it attacks the spindle fibers and prevents that cell from completely dividing. And so you end up getting all the chromosomes kind of floating around the middle of the cell as the chemical wears off, the cell forgets where it was in the cell cycle, and it would go to a resting state with twice as many chromosomes. Any division from there on out, it would maintain that higher level of ploidy. So we can do this um, in other plants. Um, and I actually do this with some of my other work where we're working on breeding for sterility uh, in some of these taxa um, be for non-invasive forms, essentially. And it's using the technology that was developed for seedless watermelons, and we're applying it to landscape plants. So I'm just kind of mentioning a couple things as teasers, because um, oaks aren't the only thing that I do. Where do our plants go once we have these cultivars and we have these selections and we've distributed them in the nurseries? We have a marketing partnership called Chicago Land Grows between um, Chicago Botanic Garden, who has a perennial plant breeder, Jim Alt, the Morton Arboretum, uh, which has me for trees and shrubs, and then we also work with a group of local nurserymen called the Ornamental Growers Association of Northern Illinois. And they're really valuable partners in helping to get the beginnings of these cultivars into the trade. Um, we have somebody to work on propagating them. We need somebody to buy them the first time 
them as liners. Uh, and this group is really great at that. And then they also market and sell their plants at the end. Um, a couple of the plants we've released in the program already is um, the Exclamation London Plane Tree. It's a hybrid between the American and the Oriental Sycamore that has really nice sycamore um, anthracnose resistance and also this nice uh, pyramidal form. Um, we have the one that really kicked off the program, the Morton Accolade Elm, which is actually right out here, um, just outside of Thornhill in the Founders Room. Um, if you want to see it, I can point it out through the window. Um, we have a couple of really cool maples, the State Street Myabii Maple, um, our Freeman Maple Marmo, um, we also have a number of shrubs we've released through the program. There's Roos Coppolina, uh, lot of folia, Prairie Flame with this beautiful fall color. It's a dwarf form. Uh, it's male, so it doesn't produce seeds and kind of throw off its clonal body. Um, we have Aronia Iroquois Beauty, which is another dwarf. It only gets to be about three, four feet tall, uh, which is a nice size for a landscape plant where Aronia can typically get to be eight to 12 feet tall. Um, then another one we're working on trying to figure out propagation protocols for is the um, Silver Sprite Bayberry, another dwarf compact version of the species. Um, so we have some really nice shrubs. We have some really nice perennials as well. Um, I mentioned Jim Alt's name earlier. He was the first one to introduce a orange flowering coneflower. Um, so there's a lot of credit there. Coneflowers have taken off like crazy. And then one of our more recent introductions is the Forever Pink Phlox, um, which is a re-blooming sterile phlox. Um, so if you guys find really cool plants that you want to help share with the world, um, feel free to reach out to me by my email, um, my phone number, um, or you can uh, contact Jim on Chicago Land Grows website. Because um, there's a lot of really cool plants out there. It's just finding that way to get them into the market. So um, thank you guys. And I have a couple of these embryos up here if anybody wants to come take a, cl a closer look at some point. Just chase me down during the day.